Hi and welcome to the Open Tech Lab. In today's video we're going to be having a look at the DS Logic Logic Analyzer by Dream Source Lab. It's a USB logic analyzer priced at $99, which is a really great price. It's a 16 channel logic analyzer with 32 megabytes of internal memory and it can sample at up to 400 mega samples per second, which is pretty good specs. Now the DS Logic was originally launched in a Kickstarter by three guys based in China and their Kickstarter was successful, they got more than $100,000 in pledges and I have here the second generation of their product, this is the DS Logic Plus. Now I've done a previous video about SIGROC and logic analyzers which you should check out if you'd like to know more. Uh, and uh, after doing that video, a couple of people asked me about this device. But the fact of the matter is, I only recently got my hands on one of these. And there is a reason for that. Uh, and the reason is because there's uh, a little bit of drama between the Dream Source Lab team and SIGROC, uh, which I'll talk about in a moment. But before that, let's get the package open and have a look at the device. And we'll do a teardown and we'll test it out. So let's get started. Okay, so let's get the package open and see what we can find inside. So on top, first of all, we have the uh, logic analyzer unit. And I'll have a look at this in a bit more detail in just a second. And underneath, we have a little tray of extras and accessories. We have a USB cable, which I've already unwrapped. And uh, this is interesting. It's actually a USB type C cable. Uh, so it's got an unusual connector, not the normal micro USB uh, on the logic analyzer end of things. Uh, we've also got a little bundle of uh, test leads here, and we'll have a look at these in more detail in just a second. And we've also got a couple of little bags of test hooks. Now, these test hooks are of the uh, cheap Chinese kind, and as I mentioned in my previous video about logic analyzers, these are pretty useless. So uh, probably going to use these with uh, my better easy hooks, which work much better than these cheap Chinese probes do. And that's everything that's inside the package. So now let's take a look at the logic analyzer unit and as you can see it's pretty simple we've got a brushed aluminium anodized enclosure here and on this end we have the USB type C connector we've got a status LED and then on this end we've got the connection header uh, which we attach the probes to. Now the probe connection port consists of this two row PCB header you see here and the pitch of the pins on this is 0.05 inch which is half the pitch of the more standard 0.1 inch header that you see everywhere. And the way this works is that the bottom row of connection pins is all connected to ground. So every single uh, input pin has a corresponding ground pin, which is a distinct improvement over the earlier DS Logic logic analyzer. And then you be, might be able to see these little slots that are adjacent to the header. And the way it works is that uh, when you come to want to connect probes to this thing, you have these little uh, probe groups that are groups of four coaxial leads and these slot into these uh, little groups here and that's how you attach uh, four probes to the logic analyzer. So I quite like this arrangement and we'll have a closer look at it in just a moment. So now let's do a little tear down and find out what's inside this thing. So we've got four screws to remove. There we go. Now there doesn't seem to be much on this side of the PCB so let's remove these four screws and then we'll be able to get the board out. Now this thing just lifts out, just like that. There we are. Now if we have a look at the top side of the board, we can get a pretty clear idea of how this board actually works. And of course a logic analyzer is a relatively simple thing, it just samples the data coming in on these uh, input port pins here, and then it packs them into USB packets that get sent to the PC through the USB port. Now, it's no surprise to see in the middle of this thing a Cypress FX2, which is a bus adapter that is able to take data on its parallel pins here and pack the data up into USB packets. And it can also do the reverse, taking data from the PC and playing it out of the parallel pins. It's pretty bi-directional, depending on the needs of the application. 
And the other function of the FX2 is it has a built-in 8051 core, which is able to supervise the communications between the board and the PC, and it's also able to control the uh, functions of the rest of the board and do anything else that needs to be taken care of on here. Now the muscle of this board is this Xilinx Spartan 6 uh, FPGA. And this is the LX9 model, which is the second smallest FPGA of the series. And this takes uh, the data that's being sampled here, and uh, it sorts through which channels are enabled, and it packs the data into data words and stores them in an internal buffer. And then it also transfers from that buffer into the FX2 and through the FX2 up into the PC. Now this device runs in USB 2.0 high speed, which will give you a transfer rate of about 200 megabits per second, which is pretty fast. And a lot of the time, uh, the data rate will be slow enough so that you can transfer between uh, the samples, sample data coming in through the input port and transfer it up to the PC in real time. And this is called streaming mode. And when you're running in streaming mode, there's really no limit on the amount of data that can be transferred. You can transfer millions and millions of samples up to the PC, up to the limits of whatever the PC can store. So it's very, very useful. You can just have an endless sampling session in that case. But the problem is that if you want to sample at higher and higher speeds and you want to have more and more pins enabled, it's quite easy to enter a situation where the total transfer rate exceeds that 200 megabits per second ceiling. And if that happens, there's no way that it's possible to continuously transfer up to the PC anymore. And so this chip comes into play in that case. This is a 32 megabyte SD RAM made by Micron. And this is used when the device is running in buffered operation. And in that case, it samples at high speed at its full speed of 400 megahertz or whatever it may be. And it can capture data up until this SD RAM is completely full. And then when the SD RAM is full and the sweep is complete, uh, then the FPGA will transfer the data out of the memory and through the FX2 up to the PC in slow time, which can be really useful if you want to capture a really short high speed burst of data. So now I've got the board under a microscope, we can have a little look at how the input front end works. So you can see here on the right, we've got all the input signals on the header here. And then the first thing that each uh, input encounters is this 7.6 kilo ohm pull down to ground. And uh, this resistor is present so that when no input is connected to the pin, you don't want the input floating around, picking up spurious inputs and crosstalk or whatever. So this resistor is just there to tie that input down to ground since it's always read as a zero in that case. And then the signal is connected into this electrostatic discharge device, and this uh, is used for uh, every fourth channel here, so it's got uh, four channels connected to it. And it basically consists of four uh, sets of clamping diodes and a Zener diode, and it's there to protect the device from any high voltage spikes that might come in from static discharge on the input, uh, which is very important to protect the FPGA from getting damaged by that kind of uh, uh, spurious signal coming in. And then in terms of uh, just normal uh, excess voltage on the input uh, from uh, excess amplitude on the input waveform, uh, the clamping is done inside the input of the FPGA here. And each, uh, each input of the FPGA has a pair of built-in clamping diodes between power rails. And this just protects the FPGA from excess voltage on the input. But the input clamps within the FPGA can only sync or source so much current, uh, which is why there's a 30 ohm resistor here on each channel. And this is there to limit the amount of current that can flow into the FPGA or out of the FPGA if uh, we have a voltage coming in that's too positive or too negative. Now, apart from this, the board doesn't have much else on it at all. It's just got this little I squared C EEPROM, 16 kilobytes of storage to store the uh, firmware for the FX2 on it. And it also has a switch mode power supply. And that is about it.
So by way of comparison, here is an image of the front end from the earlier DS Logic Pro, which preceded the DS Logic Plus. And you can see the design is pretty similar. We've got the isolation resistor before the FPGA, which is off the image on the left. We've got the ESD protection device in the middle. We've got the pull down resistor, which comes right after the input. But the main difference is that rather than just having the pull down resistor, we've got a full RC filter network here. And this is present to, I think, to try and give the input signal a bit of a helping hand to try and uh, enhance the high frequency component coming in from the device. Uh, now, I am a bit suspicious of this design. You do see it in a few different logic analyzers that are on the market, but I'm not sure that this is a particularly good idea. Uh, for one thing, you could end up adding a lot of ringing to the signal coming in so that rather than getting one edge, you get multiple edges that's created by this uh, uh, circuit just ringing away. And also you are then uh, applying a reactive load to the device under test, uh, which is not gonna be a good thing. You, that, well, that will be quite unexpected to have the logic analyzer doing that to whatever you happen to be probing. So on the whole, I'm pretty glad that they've simplified the input design in the new DS Logic Plus. It seems like a better idea to me. So yeah, very good development in my opinion. Okay, so now I've got the logic analyzer back in one piece, and now I want to take a little look at the probing arrangements they've got here. Now, I've spoken about logic analyzer probes in my previous video on logic analyzers, but the short story is basically that it is really hard to do a good job of probes on logic analyzers in general. Now, by way of comparison, this is a, a normal oscilloscope probe, uh, a times 10 attenuator probe that you'd find on uh, any typical oscilloscope. And uh, it's surprising that how much engineering actually goes into this thing. And the reason for that is that it has quite a lot of uh, unique properties. It has very high impedance, very low capacitance and very low reflectance. Uh, in other words, if you have a uh, circuit that you're trying to measure a signal off of, you don't want the probe to uh, distort the signal uh, by loading it up in various ways uh, or reflecting uh, the, the signal in funny ways. And so in electrical terms, it's as if this thing is light as a feather. It is almost invisible to the circuit when you attach to it. And to make this happen, it's certainly no simple job. It's actually quite complicated, the uh, various analog trickery that goes on inside this thing. But the problem with this is that when you want to uh, build a, a probe like this, it's okay for an oscilloscope, which might have two channels or, or four channels. But when it comes to building a, a logic analyzer, you might have eight channels or 16 channels, and uh, it will become impractical to build a proper attenuator probe on each channel, especially for these cheap uh, USB-based logic analyzers. Now, most logic analyzers you encounter don't do anything uh, in the way of quality probing at all. So most logic analyzers just have uh, a load of flying leads. And so each channel is just a flying lead. And the problem with this, as I uh, mentioned previously, is that each of these uh, flying leads is like an inductor that you're attaching to the circuit. And so uh, by attaching that inductance, you're attaching a reactive load, uh, which is going to do strange things to the signal you're trying to receive. It's going to uh, apply various distortions. Now, if we look at the DS logic, we can see they've tried to do something rather interesting. So each of the signals here, rather than being a piece of flying lead, each of these probe wires is actually a, a really thin bit of coaxial cable. And then uh, at the end, there's tiny little pieces, just a couple of centimeters of flying lead. And then you can attach some test hooks on the end if you want to do that. Now, the benefit of doing this is that it really will hopefully massively reduce the inductance of the lead itself. Because if you look at the uh, size of the inductive loop here, it's absolutely tiny, really, really small when you compare to a traditional arrangement in a traditional logic analyzer. In this case, you're gonna have your probe wire, you can see the green wire, and uh, you're gonna be probing something on your board and current must flow all the way up the green wire into the device and then all the way back down the ground wire, and there's only one, uh, back down to the board. And so we have an absolutely enormous inductive loop as a result. So we're gonna be 
applying a really large inductive load on the board. And uh, the DS Logic doesn't have this. And uh, the benefit of this is that uh, uh, the loading characteristic of the probe should be much, much more consistent at different frequencies. So with an inductor, the uh, loading characteristic that it will apply to your, uh, your device under test will vary as you get to higher and higher frequencies. Whereas with this thing, uh, mostly the loading will happen from the characteristic impedance of the coaxial cable. And therefore the uh, loading characteristic should be much flatter across the frequency range. Uh, which is really, really good, I think. This is probably uh, a much better way of doing things. But there are a couple of downsides to doing this, and uh, to explain those, uh, we need to have a little bit of a closer look at how these coaxial transmission lines actually work. So here I have a schematic of a typical coaxial transmission line set up and as you can see on the left we have a AC voltage source and this is a stand-in for whatever kind of data transmitter we might have in this circuit and then on the other end we can imagine that there will be a receiver of some kind. I haven't drawn it but it would go in here somewhere. Now it's very important with transmission lines to make sure the source and the sink are properly terminated, which is why these two resistors are here. Uh, and without them, you get awful problems with reflections as the uh, uh, signal bounces up and down uh, the transmission line being superimposed upon the signal that you're trying to convey from one end to the other, and it makes a real mess. So it's very important to make sure that each end is uh, properly terminated with the characteristic impedance. Now in electrical terms, a transmission line is equivalent to a distributed inductor and capacitor. It's an inductor because uh, this wire going down the middle has a certain inductance along its length. You can think of it as a piece of a coil uh, just floating around inside this, uh, this cable here. And it has a certain inductance as it goes along. And it has a distributed capacitance because the central conductor and the, the outer shield, uh, they act as two plates of a traditional capacitor. So there's a certain capacitance between these two conductors which are offset from each other. So in that way, it's both an inductor and a capacitor at the same time. Now to help think about that, it's sometimes helpful to think of it as just an infinite ladder of inductors and capacitors, tiny little inductances and capacitances spread along the length. Now to a DC signal, this just looks like an open circuit, so no current will flow from the conductor in the middle to the shield. But to an AC signal, such as binary data that we're transmitting, this will look just like a resistive load. And it turns out that no matter how long the cable is, uh, all of these inductors and capacitors add up to a certain impedance. Uh, this is called the characteristic impedance and in most coaxial cables this is designed to be 50 ohms and no matter what the frequency is it will experience roughly the same 50 ohms of loading and this is the case in with the coaxial cable in the DS logic it has that 50 ohm characteristic impedance just like most coax does Therefore, when you attach the logic analyzer to your device, you need to be aware that you're attaching a 50 ohm load to it, which will reduce the amplitude of the signal on the board, and it will increase the load on the transmitter on the board, uh, whatever that might be. So that's something to be careful of. And there is a second problem. If we turn back to our schematic, as I mentioned, you can see there's both the source and sink termination resistors. And these have to be present because otherwise there'll be reflections at either end of the transmission line. But the DS Logic probe doesn't have either of these. Now it's not really possible to add uh, source termination to the logic analyzer probes without building something much more complex like an oscilloscope would have. And uh, they haven't added any sync termination resistors inside the device itself. I guess they wanted the logic analyzer to be a high impedance device, which is no surprise. It will be quite unusual for it to be a low impedance logic analyzer. But all the same, it doesn't have the correct termination that needs to go with the transmission line here. And therefore there are going to be some reflections which could potentially impact the circuit we're testing. Now to help demonstrate the effect, I've got a little simulation. So let's have a quick look at that. 
So I've got a rough simulation of the probing setup running here in CircuitJS and CircuitJS is a completely free circuit simulator, it's web based and I'll provide a link to this simulation in the show notes. Now if you've watched my previous video on logic analyzers you would have seen my simulation uh, where I showed how the flying leads can attach uh, a certain loading to the device under test and so I've modified the simulation a bit to uh, try and roughly represent how the DS logic will affect the device under test. So in this uh, schematic we have the device that we're actually attaching to along the bottom here and on this uh, device we have an imaginary data source represented by this 50 megahertz square wave generator and it's transmitting something down a transmission line across a PCB to uh, some kind of receiver, maybe another chip on the board. And uh, the transmission line is correctly terminated at both ends. And then we have a little break in the middle to represent the point that we've attached our logic analyzer. Now with this logic analyzer, I've tried to put in some representative values for the uh, internal characteristics from the things we know about it. Uh, and then of course we have our coaxial transmission line here and then we have a tiny little bit of inductance just to represent uh, the little bit of flying lead uh, out at the probe end. Now it's quite interesting how this is working out because you can see the issues caused by that lack of termination. You might be able to see that uh, we have quite a lot of reflection going on inside this uh, the, this uh, coaxial cable here. Now on the left oscilloscope we can see the uh, voltage received uh, at the receiver over here and on the right we can see the voltage received uh, inside the logic analyzer. Now the signal is looking pretty mashed up in both of those oscilloscope traces. It's not the worst thing in the world in the logic analyzer. Hopefully we should be able to extract uh, a reasonable square wave out in the logic analyzer but it's looking pretty glitchy and nasty inside the device under test. So not only have we applied a 50 ohm load uh, to this uh, signal that we're attached to here which will reduce its amplitude but we're also adding a whole load of reflections which appear as these glitch pulses that are superimposed upon the uh, signal we're capturing here and uh, this is, could be quite a problem because these these edges could be interpreted by the receiver as um, uh, like a spurious edge which might be interpreted as a uh, extra clock edges and cause all kinds of problems. Now uh, hopefully in the real world there will be enough parasitic capacitance in this system to soak up these little glitch pulses so I wouldn't be convinced that these would ever really manifest in the real world uh, but it just goes to show the kind of effects uh, that you can theoretically get when you try and attach something to uh, a circuit like this. Now you might be wondering at the end of this whether the DS Logic's coaxial probes are actually an improvement over the more traditional flying leads. And my sense is that it probably is an improvement for all the problems we've seen in the simulation. So for one thing, uh, we're hopefully going to get a nice consistent frequency response uh, across the frequency range uh, by having this 50 ohm characteristic impedance rather than having uh, two massive inductive loads that we're attaching to the circuit. And hopefully with that we're also not going to get too much in the way of phase shifts being attached to the device under test also which should be an improvement uh, but it's a little bit hard to tell I don't have the equipment to uh, definitively tell uh, how well this works out. But for one thing we can do is that if this coaxial arrangement is causing a problem we can always uh, take it off the logic analyzer and do our own custom probe setup just by attaching directly to the header. So that is always an option if things are not working out with any logic analyzer's probes. Now there's no substitute for a real world test so I've set up a crude little experiment to find out if things are as bad as they appear in the simulation. So in this test I've attached my Lattice ICE40 FPGA development board and I've configured the FPGA to put out a 25 megahertz square wave and then I've attached this output signal to the oscilloscope so that we can see the shape of the signal that's being put out by the board and then in addition to attaching the oscilloscope I can attach the logic analyzer and we can compare the shape of the signal with the logic analyzer attached versus what it looks like with no logic analyzer attached. 
Okay, so here you can see the output from the logic analyzer, and as you can see, we're getting a nice uh, square looking square wave, just a little bit of overshoot here. Now, just for comparison, I will save this as a reference signal, and that will allow us to compare. Now, let me go ahead and attach the logic analyzer. Just clip it on, very good. And now let's compare that with the signal before. You can see that uh, the logic analyzer is damping out the ringing a little bit. Now, the amplitude of the signal hasn't really changed at all. And the reason for this is that the FPGA is a very, very uh, low impedance signal source. So we wouldn't expect the coaxial lead to be able to reduce the amplitude very much. Okay, so let's try again at a higher speed. So this time I've configured the FPGA to put out a 200 megahertz signal. And this is a 200 megahertz oscilloscope, uh, which means that the uh, bandwidth of the signal we're putting out, uh, the fundamental tone is right up at the limit of the bandwidth of the oscilloscope, which is why this signal looks like a sine wave, uh, because any of the higher frequency harmonics that would make the signal look more square are being filtered out because they're the, beyond the oscilloscope bandwidth and also this time I've set the channel coupling to be AC coupled and by this that this means that the uh, waveform is centered uh, at zero volts between the peaks rather than it being uh, at its true offset uh, between zero and 3.3 volts and you can see that with no logic analyzer attached we've got uh, an RMS voltage of 1.34 volts or so so now let me just save that signal as a reference uh, for comparison. There we go. And now we're going to go ahead and attach the logic analyzer. So let's go and do that. There we are. Okay. So now you can see that with the logic analyzer attached, we've loaded the signal a little bit. And now the voltage has dropped to 990 millivolts or so. So we've got a, a little bit of a drop in voltage. And now for comparison, I've hooked up the FPGA with a more traditional oscilloscope with flying leads. And as you can see on the oscilloscope trace, the results are not pretty. So the upper waveform here is the uh, unloaded signal from the FPGA. Uh, the middle one here is the reference from the DS logic. And then at the bottom here in the middle, uh, we've got this uh, result when we attach this flying lead based uh, logic analyzer. And as you can see, the signal has been absolutely destroyed and we've only got a RMS voltage of about 300 millivolts now. And this would cause major, major problems for the functioning of the circuitry in the device under test. So. On the whole, I think the results of this uh, demonstration are pretty impressive in terms of uh, demonstrating that the design of the DS Logics probes are really, really working. So now let's have a little look at the software side of things. So I first became aware of the DS Logic way back in January 2014, in the early days of their Kickstarter. And uh, at the time, I was a very active contributor to SIGROC. And as I mentioned in a previous video, I uh, originated the SIGROC GUI pulse view. And I'm not such an active contributor now, but uh, at the time I was doing a lot of work developing the, the GUI for SIGROC. And so when I found out about the DS Logic, I was really interested in comparing the design that they had implemented with uh, the SIGROC pulse view design to see if there were any ideas in their UI that would be worth replicating in SIGROC. Now at the time they were offering a link to a beta release of the DSView software uh, that was available for Windows only at the time. And so I downloaded it and I ran it up in Wine and it ran quite nicely in Wine, which is great. And I began playing with it and uh, it seemed like a pretty simple uh, logic analyzer UI. You can see it here and it's, uh, uh, this is the demo device and we've got a variety of signals displayed here. And uh, over time, as I tested it more and more, it began to really feel very familiar to me. And uh, little by little, I, used, uh, I began to notice little things in the UI. So the, you might not be able to see it, but the little chevron on the timeline uh, looks very similar to the one in Pulse View. It's not a big detail, uh, but it's something. I also noticed the way the samples text in this drop down was written is exactly the same as it is in pulse view and the way demo device is written in the device selector here is exactly the same as it is in SIGROC. 
And then I went into this little dialogue here and the way in which uh, the text enable all and disable all uh, was written again was exactly the same uh, as it's written in Sigrock. But apart from that, everything else in the UI was different. So there isn't that much uh, that would look similar. But I began to realize more and more that this may well be a fork of Sigrock Pulse View. But the conclusive evidence came when we started doing a bit of binary analysis of the DS logic program files and by running DS logic through strings and grepping for SIGROC, uh, we found a whole bunch of matches and many of these bits of text are from the official SIGROC source code repository. And so there we had the official evidence that they had taken the source code from SIGROC. Uh, they'd forked their own version. Now at this point there was a fair amount of consternation from the SIGROC development team because testing the DSView software it had the appearance that they had gone to quite some lengths to remove all references to SIGROC from the user interface. So here we are in the about screen and you can see that SIGROC isn't mentioned and all the names of the original authors have been removed and the GPL license has been removed, it's not mentioned anywhere and overall they'd seem to try and change things as much as possible just so that it wasn't so obvious that their user interface was derived from SIGROC and so there was certainly quite some annoyance that they'd chosen to do this. And so the SIGROC guys decided the right thing to do would be to try and uh, uh, encourage them to uh, be in compliance with the GPL and so we collectively wrote an email to the Dream Source Labs team explaining to them their obligations under the GPL license and there was a bit of back and forth between the Dream Source Labs team and the SIGROC developers but in the end, by the end of January, uh, they had made an initial release of the source code on GitHub. Now, in many ways, this is an interesting case study of how open source projects can end up clashing with Chinese development teams. And even to this day, the Dream Source Labs guys are controversial within the SIGROC community. And there are two main schools of thought about them. Uh, the first is that they were being deliberately deceptive, that they were trying to pass off code that was mostly written by SIGROC as their own. And in so doing, they were hoping to get some advantage, uh, that they would be able to provide this software without having to release the source code. And uh, in many ways, that's quite convincing. And they did make a lot of money off their, uh, their Kickstarter, and they've never contributed anything back to the parent project, which they uh, depended upon to get started. That's one mode of thinking about the Dream Source Labs team. The other is that they were uh, doing some kind of interim thing. They weren't planning to release the source code for a beta release. They weren't aware that they were required to by the license. And uh, when the SIGROC team reached out to them and made clear their obligations under the GPL, uh, they were happy to release the code and fulfill the obligations that they had to the license. And they continue to update the GitHub repository with new patches and they even accept pull requests here and there. So I don't think it's ever been conclusively proved which it is, so perhaps you'll have to make your own mind up on that one. So if we flash forward to the present day build of DSView, you can see it's advanced quite a bit. It has this beautiful charcoal gray theme, uh, which is quite an advancement on the appearance of the beta version and the early releases of DSView. I think this uh, build looks great. And uh, in many ways, it's quite similar to use to SIGROC PulseView because of course it's derived from it. But in quite a few ways, they've improved upon PulseView and they've got quite a few features uh, now that are present here, but actually are not present in PulseView. So they've moved ahead in some ways. Now, some of you might be wondering whether it will be possible for these features to be integrated back into SIGROC, uh, given that this is all open source software. And the answer is that in principle, yes, it would be possible and it would be great if these features could be uh, ported over. The only issue is that, uh, well, for one thing, the code quality isn't quite up to what it needs to be to go into SIGROC. And by that, I mean, for the most part, they focused on the needs of the DS logic device. Whereas for patches to go into SIGROC, uh, they need to be able to support any logic analyzer device uh, and support them properly. And so in a way, it's easier for the DS logic guys to add features to their GUI because they only have one device to focus on. 
Uh, so that's one issue. And the other is just that some of the time it can be quite difficult for Chinese development teams to contribute to Western open source projects. And of course, there's a language barrier and a time zone barrier. And there are also various cultural barriers. So, for example, uh, Western open source projects usually run on a system of peer review where patches are criticized and improved until they're ready to go into the project. But if anyone is coming from a face-saving culture, then that process of critique could be humiliating for the person who's trying to participate. And so it can be quite difficult for some guys to feel like they uh, are comfortable to contribute to an open source project. And added to which, in economic terms, sometimes it's just not a priority for uh, the team to focus on trying to get their patches upstream. So it's understandable that they haven't contributed the patches back to Sigrock, uh, but the code is available for people to come in and try and uh, derive things from their work if there are useful improvements that can be brought in that way. Now let's just have a quick look inside the device options dialog and you can see there's a few things of note here. So first of all we've got the operating mode and we can run in buffered mode, streaming mode or internal test mode. Now, in streaming mode, of course, the data is being transmitted straight to the PC over USB. And as I mentioned earlier, we're going to be limited by the bandwidth of the uh, USB high-speed bus. Uh, but on the plus side, we get an infinite sample depth. Uh, we're just limited by the amount of memory inside the PC. And in this mode, we can sample from up to three channels at a maximum of 100 mega samples per second. Whereas if we switch over to buffered mode, uh, we can go faster faster we can get, do three uh, channels at up to 400 mega samples per second which is really really good but then of course we're limited by the amount of uh, storage inside the device although it does have quite a bit of storage so that's not too great a limitation and then in addition to the buffer mode uh, the operating mode we have the threshold level so you can uh, configure the transition voltage between a, uh, a high and a low and this means that the logic analyzer is compatible with various families of logic signaling uh, whether it be 3.3 volts or 5 volts or 1.8 volts or whatever it may be you can just set the threshold level so that it sits uh, between the voltage of high and low in whatever you happen to be working on uh, we've got filtering so we can filter samples coming in um, this one's interesting. So the device supports using an external clock signal, uh, which is uh, sometimes called a synchronous logic analyzer. A synchronous logic analyzer is one where the clock signal is provided by the device under test. Uh, so for example, if you're hooking onto a parallel bus of some kind, or you can run it as an asynchronous logic analyzer uh, where the sampling is done uh, based on a clock generated inside the logic analyzer itself, which is perhaps the more conventional type. But, and apart from that, that's about it for the device options page. Now the triggering options are quite sophisticated and complete. We've got the simple triggers, rising edge, falling edge, any edge, high and low. And uh, these can be applied to any of the channels here just by selecting them like this. And it also has support for advanced triggers. So we've got options for multi-stage triggering, uh, the HP style triggering that you see in other logic analyzers. And we also have support for serial triggers. And I believe you can find various uh, words within the data stream from a single channel. And this looks really interesting and powerful. Now to really torture the logic analyzer, I want to find out how well it performs when it's in the maximum 400 mega samples per second mode. And with an asynchronous logic analyzer, you have to be aware of the Nyquist frequency, which is the uh, maximum frequency that you could possibly ever receive with the logic analyzer. And that is half the sample frequency. And the reason for this is if you put in a square wave at this frequency uh, at 200 megahertz, you're going to have one sample which is a one and one sample which is a zero. And it's not possible to uh, make a square wave and capture that with any higher frequency than that limit. Now, with logic analyzers, you'll typically need to go even lower uh, in frequency than the Nyquist because uh, for various reasons, you usually need to oversample the square wave that you're capturing. 
So let's have a look at what the results are like when we run that test. So we're all set up here. I've set to capture 64K samples at 400 mega samples per second, and I've set the voltage threshold to 1.5 volts on a three volt uh, output signal. So let's see what happens when I trigger the capture. There we are. So on the top row, we've got our 200 megahertz square wave being captured. And on the bottom row, we've got our 100 megahertz, uh, the quarter sample frequency here. And you can see the 100 megahertz uh, seems to have been captured quite nicely. Uh, we see if we zoom out a continuous uh, waveform here, a continuous series of ones and zeros, one after the other. And you can see in the little blue pop up here that we've got a frequency of 100 megahertz. Now, the capture for of the 200 megahertz square wave is less good. And this is for the reason that I mentioned earlier, uh, that you can have problems when you try and capture uh, a Nyquist frequency signal, because it is possible when you look in this area, uh, the samples are being captured. But unfortunately, because the waveform coming out of the FPGA isn't quite symmetrical, you can be in a situation where the logic analyzer will capture all the samples as zeros, because every time it samples, it just happens to coincide with a trough of the signal it's capturing and it never sees any peaks or vice versa. And so you can see that as the uh, the crystal oscillator within the logic analyzer and the crystal oscillator on the FPGA board uh, come in and out of uh, phase with each other, you can see we get these little bursts of signal. But that wasn't really the point of my test. The point was to validate that the logic analyzer has the full 200 megahertz of bandwidth on the input. And because you can see that we do uh, from time to time get a valid 200 megahertz signal being captured, uh, this demonstrates that the logic analyzer does have enough bandwidth and it is able to capture signals at this frequency. Now turning to Sigrock, Sigrock has had support for the DS Logic devices since the last major release, and that release came out in June this year, and it added the very first ever uh, driver for DS Logic devices that Sigrock has ever had. And since that time, I've been working on uh, improving this driver. I've added support for the DS Logic Plus, the device we're uh, reviewing today. And I had to do that because uh, it was part of another project which I'm working on. And uh, also that project will be the subject of an upcoming video. Now at the moment, the driver has support for uh, capturing uh, using the streaming mode at up to 100 megahertz, which is what I've got captured here. Uh, this is just a load of noise. This is nothing uh, significant, but uh, you can see the drivers working. But many of the more advanced features of the device are not yet enabled inside the driver. So for example, it doesn't support external clock uh, signal coming in. It doesn't support the filtering and some of the more advanced filtering modes. And of course, the buffered mode of operation isn't yet implemented. But this is something that wouldn't take ever so much effort to implement. And uh, at the moment, I don't have time to do it myself. But if someone else is interested in uh, digging into the driver and uh, working on improving it, I think this will be a very interesting project to get into if someone's looking to uh, do some work on Sigrock. Now, interestingly, it's not just the DSView source code that they've released. Also, at various points, they've released things like the hardware design files for the FPGA and even the schematics. So this is the schematic for the original DS Logic Pro. Now, they haven't been consistent about updating and releasing upgrades and things to all of these files, but still, they are quite interesting to have a look through, even if they are previous versions. So if you're interested in having a little bit more of a detailed look about how this logic analyzer works, uh, you can have a look at the files and I'll link them in the show notes. So at the end of this review, it's time for me to give my verdict. And I'm feeling pretty positive about this device. The price is very, very competitive compared to other logic analyzers with similar features. $99 is a great price for this device. And on the software side of things, I would say DSView has really matured in many ways. It's pretty nice to use. And if you want to use it with Sigrock, that's also an option. And I think I will be using it mainly with Sigrock going forward in the future because I think Sigrock's a bit more powerful than DSView in terms of uh, the things it can do for you. And on the hardware side, really this logic analyzer is just about as powerful is as it's possible to be 
as a USB logic analyzer. Now it is limited in its streaming speed to the PC by USB 2.0, so it could go up to USB 3.0 super speed, and that would mean it could stream much faster to the PC. But there are other problems with that, not least the fact that it adds a lot onto the bomb cost, and so it will probably add about 30 or 40 dollars onto the sale price. USB 3.0 is currently not cheap to add to a device. And uh, in terms of the sampling rate, 400 megahertz is, is pretty good. And uh, it would be possible, of course, to increase the sample rate uh, with uh, upgrades to the design. But then uh, issues relating to the probing becoming, become even more significant and probes become more and more difficult and expensive to the design. So you don't see many PC-based logic analyzers that uh, go much higher than that 400 mega samples value. And so really, it, this logic analyzer, I would say at that $99 price point is basically everything you could reasonably expect from a USB logic analyzer. So I think this device is pretty cool and I'm actually glad that I've got one, it's great. Now, if you're interested in purchasing one of these devices, you can get one from dreamsourcelab.com and I'll link that in the show notes. Now, in the buy page, there's something a bit weird here because they only have the old generation products listed like the DS Logic Pro and the DS Scope. And so I'm not quite sure what's going on here because when I ordered the DS Logic Pro, I got the DS Logic Plus delivered, which is great. And I think that's the DS Logic Plus is the one you probably want to order. So I'm not sure what's going on with the website. They seem like they need to update it a little bit. And if you're gonna purchase one, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that uh, your order gets you a plus rather than the old Pro. Now that just about wraps it up for this review. I hope you found it interesting. If you did, please hit the like button and subscribe. And uh, if anyone's interested, I'm also running a small Patreon if anyone wants to contribute to supply the channel with equipment and whatever. Uh, so anyone who's thinking of contributing to that, I'm very, very grateful. And for anyone who's watching, thank you very much. And hopefully I'll see you next time on the Open Tech Lab.